North Carolina. Um, and, and, as Lee mentioned, a lot of the different things. I'm a clinical pathologist. I'm a physician scientist. Um, I'm also midway through an MBA because I'm very much interested in how we take these technologies and develop them into therapies that help specific people. Um, this is uh, the North Carolina Outer Banks. Uh, this is my family there this year. Um, my wife is a pediatric intensivist, and I wanted to let you know that uh, not only do I have a family, I'm a 13 and a 5 year old, uh, my wife is really the person who inspired me to uh, pursue looking at inflammatory heart disease. And she's a pediatric intensivist, and so she actually sees kids, and she's a heart specialist. She sees how these diseases affect children. And it was something during our training that really touched me so much that I really wanted to devote my life to uh, making those changes. I'm going to talk about three challenges um, that we're facing. And I know that we've, we've talked a lot about the difficulties with the medical system, the difficulties with the diagnosis. But I do think there's a lot of reasons to be very positive about what is going on. Um, there's a cultural change happening in healthcare. Um, I know nobody likes it, and I know it's very controversial politically, but healthcare reform, in my opinion, is going to make the way that we look at patients instead of procedures the most important thing. And if we were looking at patients the whole time, myocarditis is one of the things that would be on our radar because it is rare, because it does such damage to people. Uh, but the challenge really is that when physicians specialists, generalists, and it's usually the generalists that are seeing uh, patients with myocarditis. This is what the patient population looks like. They're seeing an end phenotype. They're seeing the heart being very sick, and as people have mentioned, this can be caused by a number of different diseases, and those diseases change by where you are in the world, probably where you are in the United States. And these are things that have very complicated names, but when we talk about adenovirus, we're talking about the common cold. So curing the common cold isn't anything that we're going to do, and we know we're going to continue to get it, but it's one of the things that causes uh, uh, myocarditis. And then there's a whole host of reasons that people have myocarditis that aren't related to viral infection. So that's just kind of re really reiterating what people have said. When we look at the, the typical progression of myocarditis, it looks very linear. So this is what physicians are taught in books. So this starts as you know, an infection that the body then responds to, that then attacks the heart, for example, and cause, causes the inflammation and the damage. But in reality, when you see patients, that isn't in anything like that. In fact, that linear progression is really the worst case scenario. Um, it can resolve, it can reoccur, it can go directly to heart failure. And Really, the key that we need to know is we need to identify these patients that are going to go to heart failure and require transplant and are going to really need the intensive medical care in order to save them early. And that's the issue. And the type of tests that we need are those tests that identify these patients in whole populations when they uh, present to any clinics. And it's, it's a very complicated question. But there are a lot of technological advances that have been made within within the last few years that are actually being applied to different diseases, and they have this suffix of omics. So proteomics, metabolomics, uh, transcriptomics. There are ways to look at genes, the ways to look at biomarkers. Uh, when you talk about the different tests that you have in, that you can look for in the blood, we have tests for hundreds of things in the blood, but they've actually found that there are thousands of different things in the blood, and that signatures of these different proteins in the blood can actually indicate different diseases. And so there are technologies now that you can look at everything in the blood and you can look at what signatures there are. The challenge is finding the patients, and this is a less common disease, to look at to compare the patients that are going to get sick to the signatures that they're going to have in these, in these diseases. And this has actually played out really quite well with a number of different diseases. I think in the newspapers they mainly call this personalized medicine, where you have people come in and there's specific molecular diseases. Doing uh, DNA sequencing is becoming cheaper and easier. The fact that we're going to be able to do that for most patients on a pretty quick basis in the future makes it very likely that's going to be one of the platforms that we're doing uh, diagnostics on. And so what happens is people come in, they have their 
white cells in their blood taken. Uh, and then they do genetic screens and they look to see who might respond better to uh, medicine A or medicine B. And in our case, it may be those patients that are going to most likely go to heart failure. Uh, and this is really played out in cancer and therapies for blood clotting um, today. And so there are tests that people are using that are genetic based that are looking for signatures for people that will respond best to different therapies. And I think where the whole concept of healthcare reform comes in and what we're going to be doing different looking at patient outcomes is that it may not just be the drugs that we need to worry about and it may not be just the diagnostics. It may actually be considering the environment that patients are coming from. Do they have access to health care? Are they in per particular parts of the country or neighborhood that has more infections? Are they exposed to toxins, for example? Um, when we're looking at things more locally and we can diagnose them, we can actually put these different characteristics together and really find out what the best uh, potential for benefit would be. A second challenge is figuring out, and it's a related challenge, why certain populations are more susceptible to disease. This may give us some clue on the types of things that we need to be looking for. Uh, when we look at, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, this is 100% of patients, and this is over time, the percentage of patients that actually, uh, in this case, it's actually cut off, but these are patients that, this is survival until transplant. And so you can see, if you look at myocarditis patients in general, about 10% of them over time will require transplants. So it, it, it's a certain subpopulation. But if you look at their heart function when they come into the hospital, the worse the heart function is, the more likely they're going to need a transplant. And so this is a New York Heart Association scoring system where four is worse cardiac function. And so if you show up uh, and have worse heart function to begin with, you're more likely to need a heart transplant. So there's some susceptibility um, that's given if your heart responds negatively to begin with. There's also different racial populations that are affected. When you look at African American patients versus non-African American patients, and this is transplant-free survival, again, this is 100% over four years. Uh, when you look at uh, African American patients over time, they're much more likely to uh, need a transplant than non-African Americans. And they're much more likely to need hospitalization. So this is the hospitalization free from uh, heart failure hospitalization. Uh, African Americans are much more likely to need hospitalization because of heart failure compared to the rest of the population. So there may be, uh, one other thing I want to point out here, women also seem to be less susceptible to this disease. Um, and this has been mentioned, I think, just uh, on passing. These are odds ratios, and an odds ratio of one means that you have the same uh, likelihood of getting it as the general population. When you look at females, it's less than one. So you're actually less likely to uh, need a transplant, and you're less likely to require heart failure hospitalization versus men. So women seem to have some protective uh, benefits. And so really the key is to figure out why some groups are at worse risk for heart failure. Um, and this may give us some insights on how to treat and identify patients that are going to progress to heart failure. So it may be that genetics plays a role. Your immune system is more susceptible to these different uh, uh, um, infections and you respond differently. It may be the envi environment, including the availability of health care. And it may be exposures, as we talked about, to infectious uh, diseases, toxins, or different drugs. Uh, the last challenge that I want to talk about, and we've talked about them, this has been mentioned, the symptoms are very um, vague, and really I just wanted to put a face on this. Uh, and one of the common causes, particularly in Europe, that's emerging as uh, a reason that people get myocarditis is parvovirus B19. It's also called Fist disease. It's also something that nearly every kid in the United States will get. This is uh, also called slap cheek disease. It's the fifth disease because it was the fifth cause of uh, red eye in kids. Um, but most patients, 20% of them, aren't patients. They actually are completely asymptomatic. So you get this and you get rid of it very quickly and you don't even notice it. If you do get this disease, it's a very mild rash on the hands, uh, on the cheeks. Uh, but there are several different diseases that actually are pretty severe that are sequelae to this. Uh, one of them is aplastic crisis, which we see fairly frequently. Um, 
There is uh, intrauterine and genital diseases, so it can cause birth defects. And then myocarditis. So there are actually a number of very serious diseases that are caused by this emerging uh, reason to have viral um, myocarditis. And one of the things that has been shown is that you can look at viral loads in patients and actually determine which, one, which patients are more likely to have acute myocarditis versus other diseases. The problem here is, with most, like most tests, it requires, uh, there's overlap, so normal and non-normal patients all are infected. So you're really just looking at the amount of infection, uh, but you also require biopsies, and this is a very uh, risky proposition. And so if we can actually do something like this in a blood test, which is, which is done frequently uh, for other diseases, um, that certainly would be very helpful. And so I'm just going to finish up with kind of three different uh, take-home messages. And, and we've talked about a couple of these. One is that I think education is key to this, and it's education of physicians. And, and to be fair, as a physician, no one goes into medicine because they want to hurt patients. And, and there's, I don't know anybody um, personally that goes into medicine that doesn't want to help everybody that they can. Um, it's just very unfortunate that this, as well as many other things uh, in the medical environment, prevent us from doing the things that we need to be doing. And this is really one of those right things that we need to be uh, taking care of and be educated on. Uh, there are some imaging techniques that have been developed to identify um, myocarditis in some patients, but they still are not very specific or sensitive. But again, unless we have physicians thinking about these diseases, we aren't going to get to the point where we're ordering these tests. I think one of the most promising areas are these biomarker signatures, so we can actually start looking at the diagnosis of patients with myocarditis, as well as linking it up with how those patients will do when you treat them with different things and what their prognosis is. That is, who's most likely to go to heart failure and who we need to treat more aggressively. And I think this is a very uh, doable thing, and it's one of the things that the Myocarditis Foundation has spent time in organizing. And, and one of the reasons why, while this may not be a, a rare disease, technically, it's very difficult to get samples and to get patient uh, input for research studies, because you need to look, you need to have these serums in order to start matching up patient outcomes with those bio, uh, biomarker signatures. And so that's one of the things that the Myocarditis Foundation has been organizing. And it's just critical that we have these resources for researchers to be able to start doing these types of studies. And that's really all that I had. And I know we're running we're low on time, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards if that would be best. Is it okay if we, if we let uh, you ask Dr. Wolf his questions over lunch? Is that okay? And thank you very much.